Welcome to another episode of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. Shout out to my guys, Cam and Mace, for going to come and talk to me network. I'm with my guy, Akos Blue. You've been What's doing up? your thing, man. Thank you, thank you. I'm trying, I'm trying. You got anything else to add? No, no, just, That's you're it? just doing an awesome job, man. It's not thank going you. unnoticed. I'm excited. Can we give a shout out to our sponsors? Absolutely. Underdog Fantasy. Click the link in the description below and they'll match up to $100. Use the promo code MARK. That's M-A-R-K. Our favorite game is the Pick'em game. Try whatever you want, though. Shouts out to Underdog Fantasy. We got a good episode today, Dad. I'm looking forward to it. All right, all right. We've been getting some great responses. I want to say thank you to the fans, everybody sending comments, all the love that y'all giving. We read them. It impacts us as we impact you, and we're just excited to, to continue this journey. It certainly means a lot. They're going out of their way to give some incredible questions, some incredible comments, and the expertise on how the show can get better. I don't yeah. know if I'm paying that much attention to that. That can that can get to, you know that can cause some confusion, but we yeah. appreciate it all. Yeah, because because I, I, it was like one or two negative comments. Like some people were saying like just different things. I don't want to say nothing because it might mess your head up. I'm fine with it, but oh, you know, I, <laughs> it'll mess my head. It up. might mess your head up. Oh. Because some, somebody said, I got a light voice, but this I, I talk this way for the ladies. Oh, my God. It's not for y'all. Relax, man. Why did you say ladies? You, Why huh? did you say ladies like that? Because they, they caught it. What'd you, you say? It? I said ladies. <laughs> it's real low. It's nice and tender. I'm a tender person. I can't. I, I could put my deep voice on if you want. No, no, no. They're good. Well, See? You got nervous just now. Look at no, no, <laughs> your heartbeat fast. I think one of the comments was you should have your own show and just fire me. You read I'm that? Like, I'm not firing me. This just breaking y'all news. doing y'all thing in the comment <laughs> section. Let's get it. Let's get it rocking. That's what they saying. Yeah, that's what man. Saying, man. Yeah. I don't know who said that. Yeah, don't who? worry about it. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't check my computer. <laughs> <Don't> check. <laughs> All right, man. So I want to know. First question. Going off the negative comments. I know you dealt with some negative comments during your career. Was there a time where you were just overwhelmed by maybe booze in the crowd or? or negative circumstances going on outside of, of the game of basketball? The crazy thing is my entire life, high school, college, rookie of the year, second year in All-Star, my third year was the first time that I ever got booed. I'm a hometown kid playing in front of my hometown fans, and I became the bad guy. 20,000 people night in and night out booing me. And what I realized right then and there is um, that it's a business. For the first time in my life, it became a business. So it impacted me as a young youngster. But thank God that I was brought up, brought up properly by two incredible parents and a household that was very loving and caring. And I realized that was what was important. The folks that matter to you the most, not the folks that see you one time or for 20 minutes or 48 minutes. So I take it with a grain of salt. And if you don't allow the praise to define you, then you won't allow the noise of the crowd, the booze to define you neither. So I don't get caught up being too high or too low. It's a valuable lesson. Unfortunately, I learned it early on. And the funny thing is, when I realized in my third year that it was a business, people thought I was crazy because I started carrying a suitcase to the game. Instead of wearing my gym bag, I'd carry a suitcase, just being a jerk and being a wise guy. Yeah. They're like, why are you wearing a suitcase? Well, I'm coming to the office today. It's my office. So were the booze deserved? Did you deserve to be booed? It was a misunderstanding. What was the misunderstanding? I was painted out to be the, the bad guy, so it's, it's okay. Well, did I, did I deserve it? I wasn't playing up to par, which is fine. Yeah. The good news is a year, a year and a half later, we hire a brand new coach in Pat Riley, Coach Pat Riley, who's obviously one of the godfathers of the league, gave me an opportunity to win my job back. We go to the Eastern Conference Finals, and I leave New York City at that time on a high note. So shout out to Pat Riley, Coach Pat Riley. One of the, one of the craziest parts of just knowing the, the behind the scenes of it, is that one of the people who orchestrated some of the hate that you were getting during that time was Peter Vesey. And now today, you guys are, are close friends. Can you, can you elaborate on that relationship and how that even came to be? Yeah, we're going to have him on the show one day soon. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah, he's a, go. a Hall of Fame journalist, reporter. The guys that you see today that's breaking news, he's the godfather of exactly that. And what I respect most about him is he would kill me, absolutely kill me, but he'd show up the next day and ask a question. You're sitting there like, I'm not asking this guy's question. He's a jerk. He's killing me for no reason. But when it, the truth became the truth, he reported the truth. 
So I gained respect for him, even though he killed me more than anybody in, in my entire basketball career. I respect the fact that he was just doing a job. And today, he's a guy I consider a friend and I got a lot of respect for. But if he'd have came to my wedding, if he'd have came to my wedding, my father, who was a low-key, cool, calm, collective dude, I'd have saw my father beat somebody up. <laughs> this guy went so far as to put the address of the wedding, the date and the time, and it wasn't known to the public. So we get to the wedding and the streets are filled. He put that in the, in the paper? Put it in the paper, reported it. So Pop Up was like, if he shows up, I'm a handle. You take care of your business. I got. Him. What was up with that? Did you did you see him after a game or so? You took one of his girls or something? He just he just was. Uh, that's the way he reported. I, again, when you're on one side of it, you, you get bitter, you get angry, you get upset. But the thing I respect is it wasn't like you're my you're my source, you're my connect. I'm not gonna kill you. He killed everybody, mm. and and he was fair across the board. And when the tide turned, he was honest. And he, and he told the good news about me. So I got, I got respect for people that do it that way. I feel that. That's lost now. Everybody throws a stone and hide their hand nowadays. And everybody protects the sauce. So yeah. if you're my sauce and I know I get information from you, I'll dress you up and take care of you and knowing that you're staying consistent. That's not cool and that's not the way I do business. Let's get into some questions, all right? We got some questions from the, from the comment section, some things that the fans have been wanting to, wanting to talk about. That's cool? Yes, sir. All right, all right. We're going to start it off with Young Sleep 585. How did it feel to finally make it to the finals after 12 to 13 years in the league? And did you think y'all could win it? Absolutely. It was, it was an incredible feeling getting to the NBA finals. Give some background. What team were you playing for? I was playing for the Indiana Pacers in 2000, 99, 2000. We were a loaded team that had experienced great playoff success, great regular season success. Had been coached by Larry Brown, the great Larry Brown. And now we're coached by the great Larry Bird. And we had an outstanding season. And running into the brick wall called Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Chicago Bulls year in and year out and running into the brick wall called Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. We finally got an opportunity to get to the NBA Finals in 2000, where Kobe and Shaq was leading the Los Angeles Lakers. They win their first NBA championship. But going in, we certainly believed we could win. We certainly believed we were going to win. We had respect for them. We had an appreciation for them. We knew their body of work, but we felt their strength was partly our strength. We had a dynamic seven foot four center that could shoot the jump shot. It was incredible in pick and roll. And Rick Smith was dynamic as a poster player. We felt could match up, not to the strength and the brute of Shaquille O'Neal, but he can he can compete against him and do damage on the offensive end. And their two guard in Kobe Bryant, the late great Kobe Bryant, our best player was out shooting guard in Reggie Miller, the Hall of Famer. So we felt like we can answer that if we could take care of the other stuff, we'd have an opportunity to win it all. And it was a great series. That they won in six, but one that I always cherish and one that I always remember. What happened? Why'd y'all lose? It was, it was just Kobe was too much. I don't look. Your let's, job is to ask just, questions. I don't need you to throw little. I just want to know the the truth. Yeah, yeah. Because if we were sitting at home, you might be like, "Yo, Shaq, we had to trip." Antonio Davis and Dale Davis were on that team too. Yes. yes. Oh, so y'all were equipped. So what happened? You're not equipped for Shaquille O'Neal. Like okay. Brian. All right. As, as much as you may think you're equipped, you're not equipped. Shaquille O'Neal, I believe, averaged 38 points and 17 oh rebounds my, in the oh six-game series. Kobe Bryant uh, took over game four in Indiana that basically won the series in overtime when Shaq fouled out. Mm. I've talked on that before. But those are two all-time greats, and there's no shame losing to Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, that dynamic Laker team, and uh, Coach Phil Jackson. You act like, you know, is 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 something that I should hold my head down. About. No, I just want to know the real, because you know – that you left the game being like, dang, if such and such would have just focused in on the game. It was something that you could have been like, you wasn't, you wasn't pleased with. You didn't leave like we gave our best shot. You still feel like y'all could have beat them. You know what I'm going to tell you this? Kobe sprained his ankle some point early in the series, I believe. So the question was, was he going to be 100%? And when Shaq fouls out, Kobe takes over. And there's people that say, this. I never believed this, and I don't wish bad on nobody, but there's, there's people that say, I want them to be 100% healthy. I wouldn't have mind if, <laughs> if a dude's not. If you give me a championship and a dude just happened to miss one or two games, yeah. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. So I'm not one of those dudes that say I, I want to win and I want everybody to be healthy on the other side. Yeah, no, every I don't season. want them to be deadly sick, but give them a little you know, head cold or something. <laughs> You praying on their downfall. I, I didn't say I was praying on it. <laughs> a little head cold. No, I'm not praying we on a, it. We, we in a different time. A little head cold, you could be out of here. Yeah, you're right. You're right. 
I'm, I'm only being honest. All right, all right, all right, man. Let's go to the next question. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> Did that surprise you? No, that little bit. I don't want to get you in trouble. So we gonna go. trouble? Huh? How's it gonna get me in trouble? No, I'm just saying. I, I'm trying to. I'm just trying to get more stories oh, okay. from you. Okay. All right. We got DP creates, and this is for Coach Mark. He says, "What's your top five pure point guards?" That's a great question. Off the top of my head, don't hold me to it. Magic Johnson is number one. Lock that in. We're good. Isaiah Thomas is number two. Number three, guy who is all-time leader in assists and steals, John Stockton. Four, Jason Kidd. Five and six, whatever way you want to put them, Steve Nash and Chris Paul. And I'm talking about six guys that run a team like true maestros. Gary Payton is one of the greatest point guards that ever played the game, but he wasn't a guy running a, a team to the level of those guys. He had his, he was a lockdown defender tough competitor, great scorer. But those guys, as far as maestros, when I think of maestros in the history of the game, I think of those five or six guys. Any other players that you could you could see somebody throwing in that mix as far as... Ta-da! <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm glad no, you caught those posts. No, 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 I, saw, I, saw, I, saw, I, saw, I saw it in your, I saw it in your yeah, eyes. Yeah, I man. don't want to say it, no, but no, you know. No, no, no. Those, those six guys are, are, are the guys in my opinion. Okay. All right. You sure nobody else you want to show, show any love to throw their name in the mix? There's, I mean, there's some greats in the history of the game, but yeah. when you, I'm not going to go cheat and go 10 dudes, and now I've cheated the question. I'm being, yeah. trying to be as close to top five as possible, and those are the six guys that, that come to mind. All right. Let's go to the next question. You ready? Yes, sir. Okay. We got Nanik6488, and he says, From a Cleveland Browns fan, I see you are a crier, which is fine. But name a moment where you cried the most tears of joy and the most tears and sorrow on the court. The crazy thing is I am a crier, but I didn't become a crier until after my playing career. <laughs> so keep on living. There's hope for you, my friend. Um, the two times that I remember crying on the court, one in 2000 when we went to the NBA Finals, my dad had passed away, and it was unfortunate that he wouldn't be able to see me in the NBA Finals playing for a championship. Uh, so I missed that moment and realizing it, getting <clears throat> to the NBA Finals <clears throat> in Madison Square Garden, realizing my dad wasn't there, I got emotional. The uh, second time I cried was my final year uh, playing for Jeff Van Gundy, Coach Jeff Van Gundy with the Houston Rockets. And we're at the last game of the season in the playoffs and the clock is dwindling down and I realized my tank is on empty. And I knew right then and there that this was the last moment that I was going to play on a professional level. And I got emotional on the court. Nobody could see it, but I knew it. And it wasn't like I was ashamed and trying to hide it. I earned that, that tear. So those are the two times that I specifically recall crying. I'm, I wasn't a crier. There's nothing, no, no crying in basketball. So I wasn't crying on the court. But those two times were serious moments of reflection for me that was somewhat overwhelming emotion. What happened that where you where you got to the place where you like this is it? That were, were players that you knew you were better than they started coming at you, or was the the schedule just a little too overwhelming? Or no, that old dude, Father Tom. He was. I, I saw him. I was bringing the ball to the floor. And I saw him like gaining ground on me, and I'm like, Yo, here we go. No, I I knew because I was at home coming into that year. Mm -hmm. Nobody picked me up. It wasn't until midway through the season I get a call and the Houston Rockets want to pick me up. So I knew that the back nine was awfully close. And then, um, you know, you know when you're stealing money and when, when it's ran its course and the clock is dwindling down. So I had a total understanding that uh, a well done was coming from me, that, that the job was, was complete. What was that like playing on that, on that Rockets team, you being a veteran and the guard in front of you is, is a young Steve Francis playing and one mixtape? That's when I knew that it was close to <laughs> Steve Francis was a great basketball player, obviously an all-star, a guy that was an incredible athlete. I can remember, I knew it was coming down to me finishing up because he'd come down, cross over, hit you with the whoop, 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 miss the shot, and he's running down the court dapping his dude on the sideline. I'm like, dude, you missed a shot. What is going on? <laughs> you just missed a shot. He cooked you still. He's like, oh, did you see him break his ankle? I'm like, dude, dude, you missed it. Get back on defense. You missed a shot. What are we doing? <laughs> so we had, we had a, it was a fun team. Katino Mobley, Steve Francis, the great Yao Ming. 
What was that like playing with Yao Ming at a young age? He was he was unbelievable as a basketball player. I mean, offensively skilled, the ability to shoot, post, great size, great understanding of the game. I remember uh, I was working on because that was my final year, so I was preparing for a media opportunity moving forward. So at All Star Weekend, I worked in the media, just interviewing guys and doing all of that. So Yao's my teammate, and he had an interpreter with him. So I said, uh, I want to interview Yao. So I go up to him and the interpreter's like, he speaks no English. I'm like, dude, I play with him, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know he speaks English, man. Are you kidding me? He was playing that game on me. So I sat there and interviewed him. I'm, I'm sitting there rolling my eyes with his interpreter like, dude, you going to try to pull a fast one on me? You kidding me? <laughs> but Yao Ming, not just a great basketball player, as, as good a, a human being as you'll find. Just a class act. And it, it was a tremendous opportunity for me to play with him. This is just a question off the top, but... Aside from growing up in New York, of course, is your answer, but the other places that you've played, where was your favorite city? I don't judge it as far as city and where to live. I was blessed to, you know what the crazy thing is? If you'd have asked me, I'd have said, I want to stay in New York my entire life and play basketball for 17 years or whatever years of my career would have wound up being. And think about the relationships that I would not have developed. One of my best friends is Reggie Miller, who I met in Indiana. I'm the godfather of his son, his incredible son, Riker. Uh, I don't get that opportunity if I'm not traded. So be careful what you ask for because you get an opportunity to, to grow, to develop, to mature. I remember my dad, we were living in Brooklyn, and he's like, I want to live here the rest of my life. Are you kidding me? We moved from Brooklyn to Queens to Long Island. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah. And, and I remember sitting in, in the living room in Long Island. He says, could you believe I wanted to stay in Brooklyn the whole time? Nothing against Brooklyn, but the opportunity to see other things, to meet other people, and to taste part of the good life. It, it changes you, and you're forever grateful. So I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I didn't play 17 years in one place. I prefer moving around, and I have friends and relationships in each one of those stops, Indiana in particular. Um, if you told me in 87 I was going to play for the Indiana Pacers at some point and live in Indiana, I'd say no way. But the way that that city has developed and um, the great – uh, sporting events that they, they host as, as well as anybody in the country. Uh, it's something that I don't take for granted, and I'm fortunate in playing for the Los Angeles Clippers. I live in L.A. now because of my experience here of how beautiful it, it, it is, so I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. What year was that that you played for the, the Clippers? I'm the worst. I only know because it was the first time I got traded, 92, 90, 92 to 94. Wow. Funny thing is, you want to know a funny story? Yeah. First year, we go to the playoffs with the Clippers. Larry Brown leaves, and we have a brand new coach who was as good a guy as you, you'll meet named Bob Weiss. And he was a, the best thing about him, he was a magician. <laughs> so he, we get on the, we get on the, this is, this, I'm like, I'm in the league. I'm a veteran now. We lose by 20. He'd get on the plane and be like, Pick a card. Pick a card. We just <laughs> lost by 20. What do you mean pick a card? <laughs> he walked by you on the plane and pull a card out. Yeah, dude, how about game plan? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> that is hilarious. Great guy. Great, great guy. And, and uh, had a lot of fun playing for him. Un unfortunately, the one year we didn't have success. But, but a good, good man. That's funny, man. I got, I got two brothers in my youth that are a uh, winner and champion. It's uh, great tennis players, but champion he comes out his pocket with a deck of cards every single saturday he like i got some for you blue he go crazy he's, he's little baby david blaine so i don't mind magic i don't mind no, magic you, chase i love it not not when you lost by 20 and you're supposed to be that's a good point yeah that's a good point i don't yeah. want to get on the get on the team playing and we just got cooked it's you different you're a guy win wimbledon and he's showing that's you true. a that's true. card trick it's different <laughs> all right let's get back to the question because we, we went off on a little tangent but let's go back to uh I think that's what the people like, though. They like going the, off the on tangent? a little tangent. You know, it's, it's that's unscripted. True. That's true. That's true. So, what you want? You got something else you want to talk about? We don't got to. So, basically, just forget the forget the fans. That's messed up. No, no, no. We we got time for the fans. Still. I love y'all. I would I would show magic tricks once in a while. Uh -huh. I, it was a magic sh uh, store that I'd go to once in a while, so I'd show a magic trick. So I remember Danny Manning, the great Kansas center, won a national championship for Kansas, played with me with the Clippers. So I'd show him a magic trick before the game in the locker room. So we went on a winning streak, and he was like, you got to show me a trick every game since we win it. You know, it's just superstitious. So I show him a trick, and he's like, okay, how'd you do that? That was crazy. How'd you do that? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not showing The magician doesn't show us tricks. Yeah. This dude refused to come on the layup line until I showed him the trick. So he's in the back 
<laughs> waiting for me to come back and show him the trick. I got to go back in the locker room, express to him how I did the trick, and then he come outside smiling and get 25 and we win. I forgot you used to have magic tricks on deck. He used to have the fake prop thumb. He Yo, don't tell the, me. You just oh, give my it up. fault. My what, fault. What did this my do? Fault. My fault. I just told you that you don't tell your trick as a magician. What are you talking about? <laughs> they know, man. This is they not don't 1992. Know. You just told somebody you Santa don't exist. All the what are you doing? It's a guy I follow on YouTube that run through everything. He do the trick and then he show you how it was done. So you know, somebody watching thinks I'm a brilliant magician. Let me expose you. Oh, He's not man. a brilliant magician. <laughs> 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 Type in YouTube best magic tricks that you can learn in five minutes and you'll get his whole script. Go you check it out, fly, man. You said the fake thumb and everything. Man. Huh, what are you bad, doing, my man? Bad, my bad, my bad. Go you ahead, still, man. You still got the fake thumb? No, it's real. It's just... <laughs> go ahead, man. All right, man. Let's go to, go to the next question. Roger Moore, 9225 says, Hey, coach. Enough love to you and your son, my brother. I was thinking today, I would love to hear your answer on who is the best player you watch play while you were commentating. Ooh, two come to mind. Mm -hmm. Clear cut two. Kobe Bryant, the late great Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James. Kobe Bryant, who birthed Mama There Goes That Man mm -hmm. because of his greatness. And I remember the last time I saw Kobe, he came to Dallas Mavericks versus Los Angeles Lakers game. Orange WNBA hoodie with his beautiful, incredible daughter, Gigi. I remember leaving the arena and going in the back, going towards my car. And he's walking behind me and he calls, calls out my name. I turn around, and he's there. And he says to Gigi, you know who this is, right? And obviously he coached the girls team. And she goes, yes. And he goes, you know when we do hand down man down, this is what we're talking about, right? I'm sitting there like, wow, this is incredible. Wow. This is incredible. Just, just how much of a student of the game he was, how he matured as a father and a husband and a man, um, taken too soon. But clearly covering him was incredible. Covering his finest moments was incredible. Documenting history as far as their championships and their success. And the same thing with LeBron James. Covering him and his incredible run that he's had for 20 plus years. The success, um, the birth of freestyling different you know, phrases and all of that. Um, I've been blessed and two guys that I owe a lot to because of the way that they perform, making my job easy as a fan and a commentator. Yeah, when I, watch, when I watch old clips of the NBA, it's amazing how many moments you're the voice of. You, Mike Breen, and Jeff Van Gundy. How many big moments I hear hand down, man down, or a mama, there goes that man, or a bang. It's, it's truly legendary. And there's, for you to get your flowers, there's never been a black man to call as many NBA Finals games as you. And that, to me, is something that I don't ever see anybody bring up but it's, it's legendary for me to look at my father and be like, wow, as a broadcaster, your Hall of Fame also. Well, thank you. It's, it's crazy because somebody brought it up during the year last year that no uh, African-American has called more championship events than me. And uh, that's, that blows me away. I mean, but I'm watching games, as you talked about, Mike Green, Jeff Van Gundy, obviously Lisa Saltis. And I miss Jeff Van Gundy calling games. I mean, I, I got to be honest. No knock to who's calling games, but what are we doing? Yeah. I mean, as a, as a fan of the game, I miss hearing him say something crazy. Yeah. Man. And be the voice of those moments. Um, a true genius and somebody that added to the, to the, to the broadcast. We got to get Coach on the show, man. What's going well, he's, on? He, he's on the way. He's, All right. I mean, he's big time to me some point this month. You ain't, I mean, when, when we asked for well, breakfast, you didn't say sometime this month. He's like, I'll meet you downstairs. Why we got to wait for you to give me some time this month? He relaxes, man. Let him get his, get his, let him get his uh, chill time off, man. No, you want to know the truth? Yeah. I think he's upset because we play Word with Friends. We play like three, three games mm -hmm. at a time, a, a Word with Friends app. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been I've been rolling. Early on, he had me. He was beating me. Mm -hmm. Lately, I've been on a roll. So I think he's a little frustrated, and, and the competitive juices is making me wait out because he's upset because of the frustration. Now he'll give you a different story. So you've been cooking, Coach I've Jeff. Been, I've been I've been cooking. Is the street going on? Yeah, he won't. He, he's not going to acknowledge it. But yes, there's a street going I can't on. Can't wait to ask him about this, man. <laughs> this dude is the most competitive. He's rest in peace to even my even my grandmother. This dude would not let her get the title of the Scrabble Queen. 
Every single time she, he was here, he'd be like, I'm the Scrabble King. I'm the Scrabble. My grandma was like 85 years old, and he's, he's holding on to the fact that he was better than her at Scrabble. You want to know a funny story about that? What? We got time? Yeah, okay. we got yeah, time. Yeah. Two things. One thing, I'm, a, I'm the best bass player in the land. That's one. <sighs> but Scrabble, right? My mother, my mother, my incredible, beautiful mother, we would play Scrabble. And my dad would go upstairs. He do now. This is hilarious. My dad go upstairs, shower, put on some cologne. He get ready for bed. He's in bed. My mom's downstairs playing Scrabble, which is me and her head up. I beat her. Right. So the next day, same thing happens. I beat her. Next day, my pops like, "You got a minute? Can I talk to you?" I'm like, "Pop, want to talk to me?" He's like, "You're killing me, man." <laughs> <laughs> my pops like, "You're killing me, man." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "I understand you winning the match, but I'm upstairs." <laughs> I'm paying the price, <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. So I, had, I finally realized what he was saying. I let her win some games. Next morning, he's smiling, smoking a cigarette now. <laughs> oh, so. He was messing up Pop-Up, man. Yeah, was I was, going I was, yeah, I was messing him up. He, I respect the fact that he pulled me aside and let me know. <laughs> so you let her win? You know Nana was she, had she no wouldn't clue. let you get away. And, and the messed up thing I told her, I said, look, because she get put a streak together, and now she get all cocky and arrogant. I had to tell her, I'm letting you win now. I'm letting you win. She's like, how are you letting me win? I told her she didn't believe me. Man, this dude, she left the earth with this dude saying, I'll let you win. He couldn't even just let his own mom get the win. This is crazy, man. This <laughs> You're doing a great job as a host because these are stories I've never told. I've no, never this said. Is, yeah, this is good. I'm telling oh you, I need goodness. these stories. All right, let's get let's get back. To, you got anything else to no, add? No, no, I, I'm, you, you the same guy I didn't want to get me in trouble about 10 minutes ago. Now you're like, you got anything else to no, add? No, I'm just saying you're feeling no. good this episode. No, let's no, go. No, Come no, on. No, I'm good. I'm good. All right, all right. Let's go. We got MRI Bug. Oh, Mr. I Bug. When all is said and done, do you think LeBron deserves a statue in Cleveland? Miami, and Los Angeles? I say yes. Great question. It's one that you don't answer right away. You think about clearly in Cleveland, not just a statue named the building after. What the heck? Miami, obviously, Dwayne Wade got his. Donis Haslam got his. Uh, number retired, well-deserved. I believe that LeBron James will have a statue because of his accomplishments in a Heat uniform. And was Los Angeles Lakers... I don't compare him to the greats that have statues outside the arena. I compare him to when he signed with the Los Angeles Lakers, nobody thought they were winning a championship. He delivered a championship, and who knows what the future holds. He deserves that moment. He's making history every time he's scoring a basket in a Lakers uniform by being the all-time leading scorer, and he's adding to that. I, I believe he deserves a statue in all three places. Yeah, he deserves a statue all three places. We know places. what you say. Huh? We why know you what gotta, you say. Hold on. Why, why did I let you get, get in your bag and get your, your joint off, but I can't, talk, I can't talk my talk? Because there's certain topics that you just, you're blind to. No, I got something to add to this. It's very valuable. Do you believe that LeBron James, here's a question for you. Do, do you believe that like Bill Russell, his number's retired all throughout? Do you believe LeBron James' number should be retired? This is what I'm saying. If That's you let me make my point, you would have you would have heard this. Okay. First off, yes, it should be retired everywhere. And not only does he need a, a statue in Miami, Cleveland, Los Angeles, put a bronze statue at the NBA headquarters too, because it needs to be historic. This is we never seen the things that he's doing. Put some respect on this man's name. If you please. put a, if you put an NBA if you put a statue of LeBron the NBA office. Is there anybody else that deserves one? No. That would be a no. No. It's nobody else that's doing what LeBron has done. He's, he's statistically head and shoulders above everybody else. So can we start respecting him on the level that he is? I'm not going to name names, but there's nobody that's done what he's done. We have, an, a, we have a, a champion in Bill Russell that has hands full of championship rings. Respect to Bill Russell. We have Russell. Michael Jordan who's done what he's done. We have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who's done what he's done. You're saying LeBron James, if they were to put a statue in front of the NBA office, it should just be one, and that be LeBron James? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, just a single LeBron James statue. That's all we need. Because? You, because he's alone. He sits at the pinnacle. What, he's the best basketball player of all time, and the numbers show it. This is a great question. What's more impressive, being the all-time, and I, I'm just asking you the question. Mm-hmm. What's more impressive, being the all-time leading scorer in the history of the game or saving the league? How about... No, 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 no you didn't answer the question. I'm about to answer the question. How about Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. It's documented, save the league. 
What's more impressive? How about both? Because LeBron saved the league too. I'm fine with you saying both. No, no, he no. Didn't LeBron save the did both of those things that you LeBron said. LeBron James didn't save the yes, league. Yes, he did. Huh? When he was in Miami, he made the decision that switched the thought process of all NBA players. It showed that the power is in the NBA. I'm spitting facts, y'all. No, you're it showed not. that the that the power was in the players' hands, and he shifted the dynamic. So who changed the game? He, LBJ, Larry Bird, and Magic Johnson. Do you understand that there was a time that the NBA Finals was on tape delay? They saved the league. They changed the game. This, uh, this ain't. They, they the, did. The, um, let me make it clear. This is not an either or. This is not a shot at either one. Of course. This is all greatness. But let's not just shoo away what Larry Bird and Magic Johnson did. They saved the game. No, they did. All respect to Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan, all the greats. I'm just saying that we diminish LeBron. Everything that he dealt with even from the beginning, before he was in the NBA. This dude's career is impeccable. What, you don't, this ain't an argument. You, yeah. I, got no, I got no issues with that. All right, all right, I'm just making sure, man. I'm just you just sure. one-sided. I'm just trying to get you to, you know. No, no, no. Y'all generation is one-sided. Y'all come in and try to bully this new generation and say, oh, remember us. We remember y'all. We respect y'all. Y'all did great. We, we love Michael Jordan. I rock Jays all the time. But what, we going to wait 30 years and then I'm going to have to argue with my son and say LeBron was the best? Blah, blah, blah. Like, nah, if somebody comes that's better than LeBron, I'm going to just respect it. I'm going to do that too. No, y'all not really respecting it. It's people that have come that are better than y'all generation and y'all haven't respected it. Mike? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Le- go ahead. Look, you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> all right, man. Last one. We got an interesting topic from the Dreadman J attacking your air. Oh, snap. This is perfect. This is perfect. He says, we're done with the 80s, 90s. Was trending on Twitter recently in regards to NBA fans, and they need to stop living in the past and saying that players like Jordan would not thrive in today's NBA, which to me is a bunch of BS. Coach Jackson, the young ones are coming for you. What do you say about it? What do I say about people that said that Michael Jordan can't impact today's game? No, it's a trend going on. It's basically saying we're done with the 90s. And basically it's, um, it's on social media platforms. They're showing clips. Yeah, I've seen it. Oh, oh. Yeah, Why are you acting like you haven't seen it? I want, I'm, I'm trying to continue to make you... I mean, you've gone from here to here. So more, I'm just throwing you He's, a lot. That's cool. So you can explain it for the people. But yeah, yeah. yeah. The, these videos make no sense. I've seen a video saying Michael Jordan can't go left. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you, a guy that is sitting here with no championship rings because my Indiana Pacer teams and my New York Knicks teams were beaten by the Chicago Bulls. Michael Jeffrey Jordan had zero flaws on the basketball court. He can go right, he can go left, he can shoot the mid-range, he can shoot the three, he can finish at the rim, he can finish in traffic. You try to beat him up, he's gonna get up and respond. He was an elite defender. He had no flaws as a basketball player. So save your tape and don't let it lie to you. He can go left, right, and do everything in between those lines. We had no answer for him. Can you statistically look at the analytics and say, well, if we send him this way, it gives us a better chance of being successful? That's what everybody that's ever played any sport. But he had no flaws and no weaknesses in between those lines. That can't be debated. I lived it. See, this is what I'm talking about. What player has no flaws? Y'all are creating this image. And I, I, I don't agree with the fact of we're done with the 80s or 90s. I respect Michael Jordan. If, if it's not LeBron as the greatest basketball player of all time, it's Michael Jordan. So I respect Michael Jordan. But the dude has flaws. When I watch him try to score over, over three or four players, the same way we called out Kobe for making selfish plays, there were times when Jordan made selfish plays and that made him great also but we can't sit here and just gloss over the fact that as real basketball players every great basketball player has a flaw or a shortcoming and and michael jordan every time he stepped on the court wasn't the best player every single time (laughs) he wasn't can we be realistic just like lebron when he plays every night he may not be the best player just like kevin durant he could he could get the, the, better can, the best can be gotten of him on a daily basis. That doesn't mean the players are better than him, but we have to be realistic. I understand what you're saying. Can Kevin Durant outplay LeBron James in a seven-game series on a given night? Yes. Can Junebug Johnson outplay LeBron James in a one-game scenario? Yes. Junebug's not better than LeBron. 
No way, shape, or no form. Michael Jeffrey Jordan, just in case you haven't heard what I said, had zero flaws in between those lines. Zero. Y'all are delusional, man. Y'all got to stop it, man. I'm Can ringless. We... I'm ringless because of that. A lot of people are ringless because of LeBron, too. If I brought, if I brought in DeMar DeRozan and, and, and had him talk about the times that LeBron was cooking the Raptors year after year after year, I'm sure he would be like, man, that dude is unstoppable. You saw it up close. He was amazing. But the thing is... I'm watching these 90s and 80s games. The defense was lackluster at times. The, the effort was lackluster at times. It looked like somebody was drinking a Henny bottle on the bench. People was leaving during halftime and coming back. The stat books were a little shaky. I don't know, man. I'm kind of with the, I'm with, the, with the trend, man. We got to keep it a buck. Did you, living in 2024, describe 1990s defense as what? Lackluster, y'all didn't Lack, have. I'm gonna repeat that again. The game we're watching today, you're saying in 1990 the defense was lackluster. What what is it today? Y'all were playing the same defense. Y'all just have have created this whatever nostalgic thought is in your mind about the defense that y'all were playing. Y'all have forced it upon the new generation to say that y'all were so immaculate at your competitive edge, your defense, your grit. These dudes are the greatest athletes we've ever seen walk this planet, playing defense with new schemes, things that y'all didn't even talk about, analytics. What? And you watch your mouth. What? We, we talked about analytics. Y'all didn't have the analytics that we, we have had, today. We, don't, we didn't have them as quick as we, we get, we're getting them today, but we dealt with analytics. Like I said, we studied Michael Jordan. We studied the great players that we had to face. We understood tendencies by documenting how many times they went left, how many times they went right, how many times they took a jump, how many times they went to the paint. We didn't have it as quick. It wasn't too, you know, right away that we had the analytics, but we utilized the analytics. We capitalized on the analytics, and there's no analytic that'll tell you how to beat Michael Jordan. There was no answer. There was no answer, which is okay. But they're, they're not playing defense today, so you watch. When you do this to an old school dude, they know what that means. Hand to the chest, grabbing the waist, Moving you wherever I want to move you, being physical on the defensive end, you cannot be that way in 2024. The defense in 1990 was far superior. End of story. I respect that. With all due respect, I respect that. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you stand your ground on that one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? No, no, no. You don't. You don't pull. You don't. You don't got me out of my bag now. So. Yeah, you good. You good. You sure? Yes, sir. Any other comments you want to talk? No, about? No, no, no. I think it was a great job answering questions. All right. Let's get to these pitches. Can we do flashback time? Sure. All right. We got some good pitches, man. We're going to throw this one up. I grabbed this from your Instagram. What are you doing with the football in your hand? Is this, this your best Warren Moon impression? No, Dan Marino, Tom this, Brady. What? <laughs> um, my first time going to the park after I tore my Achilles, seeing the movement, seeing if I still had the ability to escape the... Mayhem. Yeah, I, I know the word. Okay. All right. I'm just, just trying to Showing a little bit, you know. Okay. Escape the pocket, make a play. I had my youngest son, Yankee, catching, you know, post routes. Mm -hmm. So we went out there and just see if I still had it, and it was it was there. Did you, you, you still had the passes? Yeah, so I filmed a little video, and I wasn't a quarterback in football. You know, I was more of a wide receiver, tight end. Thank you. Lull, lull you to sleep, didn't have the speed, but got to my spots and had – Impeccable hands. Okay. So you did this. Was you use a running back or fullback? No, 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 no. Well, I'm just you seeing you, you doing know, the, the motion. the rock. Once I okay. get into traffic, I'm protecting the rock. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Were you nice at football? Yeah. When? <laughs> when were you nice at football? Growing up. My, my high school coach didn't let us play football. He only okay. let us play one sport. But I was an athlete of the year in my middle school, and there was only one player better than me. Obviously, I, I, I submit humbly. I was the best basketball player. I was the best baseball player. There was one dude better than me in football. So they had athlete of the year. I'm thinking, this dude might win it because he's better than me in football. He was a good football player. I won it, but it wasn't because uh, it was because I closed the gap as far as the football was concerned. Mm -hmm. They respected my ability to catch catch passes and make plays. You act like it's foreign. I'm, I'm saying something I didn't. You've seen me run routes and play football and play catch. 
No, I see. You, yeah. You, yeah, you're decent. Yeah, it's not like I'm saying something that is unbelievable. No, I give you your flowers. When you grade or something, I give you your flowers. Thank but you. you know, football, you're, you're okay. Okay, thank you're you. All right. You're a good quarterback. You got the vision crosses over from football, to ba- from basketball to thank football. You. So I, I give you that. that. Thank you. <laughs> my question to you now is my time. Let's, I brought a picture. You're not the only one to flashback moments. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at this picture. What's your thoughts about this? <laughs> Man, that's an amazing picture, man. That is. I I don't even remember why why Kobe came over that day, but I remember him being the same way he's always been, a younger version, of course, and then us going in the backyard and shooting some hoops, hanging out, him showing me some stuff, and those memories have always have always stuck with me. Um, you you were there. Why why was he over at the house? It's a crazy thing. It's, the timing is is what a coincidence that. Steve Stout, the dynamic music executive and marketing expert, has been on the Shannon Shop, Uncle Shea Shea uh, show lately, and he talked about Kobe Bryant living with him for, I don't know, six months or whatever amount of time it was. And in Saddle River, New Jersey, Steve Stout lived four doors down from us. And when Kobe was staying with him, one day, because Kobe was a guy that wanted to talk to people and learn his craft, whatever it wanted to be, when he wanted to be educated on a certain topic, he found people that he respected. One day, just get a knock on the door, and it's Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant knocking on the door, comes in like, and just sits for an hour, spends time with you, spends time at the house, asks questions, and it was, I, I found I, incredible respect for him because he was a student, not just of the game of life, and he understood the importance of impacting people's lives. He was never too big for himself. That's a, a, a picture that, uh, again, truly cherish. And uh, how many kids said it was in their backyard as a kid shooting shots with Kobe Bryant? Unbelievable. And years of going to the Kobe Bryant camp, Kobe Bryant Academy, his, his character is unquestioned. The giving back that he's done, the impact that he's had on the, on the younger basketball generation is, is unprecedented. Truly deserves three statues in front of the crypto. He does. Let's make sure we give a shout out to Underdog. Shout out to Underdog Fantasy. Click the link in the description below and use the promo code MARK, that's M-A-R-K, to get a $100 matched. Go do it right now. That's a wrap for this episode of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. This is my guy, Blue. Special shout out to Cam and Mace, Underdog Fantasy. Let me leave you with this gem of the day. Do not accept in winning what you will not accept in losing. Bad habits are bad habits. Doing things the wrong way are doing things the wrong way. If you accept it, it will come back to bite you. Don't accept it. Move forward. Blessings.